Hello, this is Deborah Cohen, and you're watching A Story and a Song. I will be right back after this brief intro. You are my Deborah Cohen, and I hope you're all doing great today. It's a wonderful day to be alive, and uh, if you have survived COVID, that's a big thing to be happy about. So be safe, be wise, and be loved. And in order to be loved or love others, we have to have love within first. For those of you that just celebrated the Jewish holiday Tu B'Av, we know that we have to have love inside of ourselves before we can give it to somebody else. Doesn't that make sense? If your hands are empty or your heart is empty, what have you got to give? Here. Yeah, here we go. So, anyway. <laughs> you will be too much for some people. Hint, those aren't your people. And the reason that this really resonates with me now is because I still got some of that rock tendency in my the fiber of my being. And I'm trying to take that part of me that's real into the, let's say, religious sect, for general speaking. And they're like, uh, why are you so animated? Or why are you so loud? Well... <laughs> <laughs> Why do you move too much when you sing? <laughs> oh my. Oh, you get ready for it. So if somebody's picking on you, just don't think you're alone because you're not. And you can come into this tribe here. I'd love to have you come every Sunday at 1130 a.m. Eastern time. And we can uh, share. Actually, if you have a story yourself about how you've been jaded by your friends when you tried to to choose the, the the path of light. It's called the path of light. If you choose that path of light, get ready to be misunderstood, uh, uh, accused, ridiculed by family, by faithful friends, by your lover, or even your spouse, unfortunately, because that's the way it is. Too much talking. So, so I wanted to talk have? today about the Messiah. When you're looking for your soul and the, the reason for being, your soul is elevating to the light, the higher places in God. And your, your soul is looking for soul food. Now, some people know, they think they know who the Messiah is, and that's not what this is about. So please don't start proselytizing in the chat. I'm sharing from the perspective of Judaism. And this is an article I want to share with you from, let's see, Wellsprings Magazine in 1992. Belief in the coming of the Messiah is a long-standing and integral part of Judaism. The Bible, especially in the prophetic texts, is filled with references to the Messianic redemption. The Talmud and the Midrashim also contain many discussions about the nature of Mashiach and the Messianic era. Mahmonides codified belief in the Mashiach as one of the essential principles of Jewish faith. At the beginning of his Mishneh Torah, he writes that, quote, one who does not believe in Messiah or who does not await his coming denies not only the prophets, but also Torah and Moses, our teacher, end quote. The Jewish liturgy is filled with prayers for redemption and the coming of the Mashiach. 
One finds several in the text of the Amidah, which, together with the Shema, is the most important Jewish prayer and is recited three times a day. The Lubavitcher Rebbe has recently called for a renewed awareness and emphasis on the idea of the Mashiach's coming. Efforts to do so have elicited reactions ranging from enthusiasm to suspicion to intense opposition. And that's what happens when you start talking about the Messiah. Unintentionally get experts. <laughs> and then you get those that think they know everything. Ah, thank you. First time chat in Twitch from Marty Cohen. God's got you and me in a very good place. I say amen to that, dearest one. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Okay, so we're talking about the Mashiach, Marty, in case you just popped in. To clarify the meaning of Mashiach, Wellsprings asked a scholar of contemporary Jewish thought and literature to engage a Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi in a discussion addressing some of this discomfort. Susan Handelman is a professor of English at the University of Maryland, and a contributing editor to Wellspring. Um, so we're talking to Manus Friedman, rabbi and dean of Ba'is Chana Institute for Jewish Studies in St. Paul, Minnesota. He's the author of, quote, Doesn't Anyone Blush Anymore? End quote. Published by HarperCollins. Handelman says, The Lubavitch movement has recently created quite a stir with its renewed emphasis on the coming of the Mashiach. What does it really mean to say that Mashiach will come? Ooh. The rabbi answers, The ultimate authority on that is Mahmonides. Mahmonides says that there will be a Jewish leader who will be a descendant of King David, who will bring Jews back to Judaism, and who will fight God's battle. If he does so, we can assume that he is Mashiach. If he then goes on to build the temple and gather all Jews back to Israel, then we will know for sure that he is Mashiach. Now, this means that Mashiach comes not by introducing himself as Mashiach, Mashiach is a Jewish leader, so Mashiach comes through his accomplishments and not through his pedigree. Okay, Handelman, she asks, in other words, does the coming of Mashiach mean that we make this assumption about a certain person, but the person doesn't himself declare it, and then one day this person finally says, it's me? Or does the candidate actually have to go and build the temple in Jerusalem? She asks. And the rabbi replies, Mahmonides says that once he builds the temple and gathers Jews back to Israel, then we know for sure he is Mashiach. He doesn't have to say anything. He will accept the role, but we will give it to him. He won't take it to himself. And his coming the moment of his coming in the literal sense would mean the moment when the whole world recognizes him as Mashiach. And she asks the rabbi, what specifically does that mean? And the rabbi replies that both Jew and non-Jew recognize that he is the responsible for all these wonderful improvements in the world. And she asks the rabbi, what will those wonderful improvements in the world be? The rabbi Friedman says, an end to war, an end to hunger, an end to suffering, a change in attitude. We're also talking about Mashiach being a change in attitude. Instead of people tending towards the evil, we start to tend towards the good. Instead of being evil, being the primary mover and shaker, good becomes the primary mover and shaker. Now, how is that going to happen? Who's going to cause that to happen? Somebody is generating a kind of new energy that's making people think differently. 
and feel differently and see things differently. And she asked the rabbi, yet isn't it collective Israel, i.e. all the Jews in the world who are having to do their part in that endeavor? Why maintain that it's just one person who is putting out this energy? And how does the person do that? The rabbi Friedman says, everybody has a little bit of Mashiach in them, but still there is the one who is Mashiach. I think that everybody in Moses's generation was a little bit like him. She asks, how so? Rabbi says, they all received the Torah. They all heard God speak face to face. So they had certain qualities that are unique to Moses. And because they were his generation, they shared those qualities. In our generation, we all share a quality that resembles Mashiach. But there must also be a Mashiach. This idea that there is a Messianic era without Mashiach is like the 60s without Bob Dylan. (laughs) And I can understand that. Bob's still going today. Bob, it's never too late. She asks, if I am to agree with you that this is the Messianic generation, what would this quality be? Rabbi Friedman says, number one is tshuva, returning to God. There has to be something about the people of Mashiach's generation that helps produce the Messianic benefits. Teshuva is definitely a phenomenon unique to our generation, and that means turning back to God. She says, Why is teshuva an essential quality of Mashiach? Rabbi Friedman says, let's compare it to a relationship. God makes certain overtures. God chooses us. God took us. God gave us. God taught us. God protected us. Mashiach means the time when we respond to him. Handelman asks, Teshuva in Hebrew also literally means response or answer as well as return. Rabbi Friedman says, right, not teshuva as regret for the past, but teshuva meaning you've done for us and now we're responding to you. And that is the conclusion or the cons- consummation of a relationship. So she asks, yet hasn't it been the case that in other historical eras, the Jews have responded to God, indeed returned to God with more devotion than they have in this generation? Rabbi Friedman says, no. In the past, it was more God's doing than our doing. In the past, when we had a great teshuva movement, it was because God performed the miracle and blew us away. And we were so inspired and so moved by it that we did teshuva. But it was really his doing. This same is about coming out of Egypt and Chanukah. Whatever it was, it was always his doing. She says, wasn't the Hasidic movement in its origins a teshuva movement? Wasn't that the Baal Shem Tov's call? Rabbi Friedman, yes, the Baal Shem Tov described it as preparation for the Mashiach. It has been a 200-year project. She says, why then do you say that Teshuvah is a phenomenon unique to our generation? Rabbi Friedman says, because of the fact that Yiddishkeit is on the rise, not on the decline. Fifty years ago, people were predicting that Judaism was over, that it was irrelevant, no longer served any purpose, and that in a few years it would be gone. It's certainly not gone. And Marty, why don't you put in the chat, what is Yiddishkeit? And Handelman says, yet that has been the case throughout Jewish history, hasn't it? People have always been predicting the demise of Judaism, and it has not ended. 
So one might still argue that there's nothing radically different about our era as opposed to previous historical eras. Rabbi Friedman said, But the teshuva phenomenon is different. In the past, people predicted that Yiddishkeit would die. It didn't, because those who were religious stayed that way. But we never had this mass return of people who have no reason to return. Handelman says, well, you describe it as a, quote, mass, end quote, return. But statistical studies of the Baal Teshuva movement have claimed that numerically, it is very small. The number of actual Baalei Teshuva who return to observant Judaism compared to the number of Jews who are leaving or intermarrying or who don't even belong to a synagogue is minimal. And Marty says, Yiddishkeit is living a Jewish lifestyle, performing identifiable rituals like wearing a kippah and tzitzit. Thank you, Marty. That is true. Yes. Also just preferring Jewish food or kosher food, right? Thank you, Marty. Okay, so Rabbi Friedman says, I'm not talking about the Baal Teshuva per se, that handful who go off to yeshiva. I'm talking about the general return to more tradition rather than less, more Jewishness rather than less, even among the reform. <laughs> so there is, again, an attitude change. She says, still, one could reasonably predict that just as many Jews will marry out of the faith as will make those attitudinal changes. Fifteen years ago, the intermarriage rate was much lower than it is today, so one could also look at it in the reverse. Rabbi Friedman says, yes, I suppose one could, but that's not news. The fact that there's a dropout rate, the fact that there is assimilation, is understandable. It's reasonable. It's not a miracle. If you don't teach and you don't inspire, time wears away at you. It's been 3,000 years since we stood at Mount Sinai. What do you expect? The miracle is that people pick themselves up and decide to be more observant rather than less observant. And she says, well, this return to roots is as a big trend in America among many ethnic groups, not just the Jews. It's a conventional part of American culture today. Friedman says, that's part of the miracle. She says, well, why is it a miracle? Rabbi Friedman says, the prophecy about Mashiach is that Elijah the prophet will come and he will return the parents to through their children. When you have a return to tradition, you're basically going upstream. Tradition comes down. The parent gives it to the children and the children give it to the grandchildren. But for the grandchildren to pick it up when the parents didn't have it, this is going against nature. Today, the only way to be Jewish is by doing teshuva, even for those who are born in a religious family. You have to opt for Yiddishkeit. And it's not given to you on a silver platter as it was in the past. So today, we have a very voluntary and democratic kind of Judaism that never existed. People predicted that if you would allow people to choose, they would never choose Judaism. But they are choosing it. And even amongst the most assimilated, there are intermarried couples who bring their children to yeshivas and day schools because they want their kids to hold on to that Judaism. So intermarriage is not what it used to be either. Intermarriage used to mean I quit. Today, people intermarry largely out of ignorance, not out of rejection. What is also unique is the approach the Rebbe has taken in the last 40 years, that every Jew is Jewish, and every Jew wants to do mitzvot, and no Jew can sever his or her ties with God, and no Jew is ever lost. And indeed, here you have people who are intermarried, totally ignorant, totally assimilated, 
but they want to be Jewish and they don't hesitate to come to a rabbi and say, teach me. So she says, but take, for example, German Jewry at the turn of the century. The situation there was very similar to that of American Jewry today. The parents had emerged from the Stels of Eastern Europe, Germany had liberalized, and Jews could now enter universities and become citizens. These Jews left Judaism and assimilated. And later, there was a movement to return to Judaism by their grandchildren, for example, Buber, Golem, and uh, Rosenzweig. So I could tell and well argue that it has happened before. And there is nothing unusual in this trend of return, Rabbi said. Even if I were to go along with you, the few individuals like Buber and Rosenzweig did not really start a mass movement back to Judaism. They wrote a book, people read it, and that was the end of it. The assimilation continued. She says, are you saying that this is a generation of teshuva and that the core message of Mashiach is teshuva? And Marty says, but there is nothing new under the sun. Yes, that's right. Nothing new under the sun. (laughs) So Rabbi says to the question about, are you saying that this is a generation of teshuva and that the core message of Mashiach is teshuva? Rabbi says, yes, as Rav says in the Talmud, all we need is to do teshuva, and Mashiach comes for all the predestined dates for the redemption have already passed, according to the Sanhedrin 97b. So all you scholars listening, take a note of Sanhedrin 97b and notice that according to Rav Friedman, all the predestined dates for the redemption have already passed. And she says, but why has the Chabad movement recently begun putting such a great emphasis on the idea of Mashiach now? Why specifically now? And Rabbi Friedman says the primary reason is that the Rebbe is saying that now is the time. And how are we going to know when Mashiach comes if not by listening to the experts? In addition to that, the Rebbe sees the miracles of the Gulf War in Eastern Europe as miracles of special historic significance, not just miracles of survival as we have had for thousands of years. So she says, one might wonder, though, whether there is anything messianic about these miracles. Saddam Hussein is still in in power. Well, when this was written... No, he's not still in power. <laughs> this is 2022, and this was written in the 90s. Oh, no. At the time she said this, Saddam Hussein is still in power. No, he crawled into a hole, and we got him. But anyway, the former Soviet Union is in economic chaos. The Syrian dictator has gained renewed influence in Middle East politics, etc., And Rabbi Freeman says to that, of course, the problems are far from over, but the miracle is the change in attitude for the good. What is happening today is that quite suddenly there is a recognition of ideological evils and a change in moral attitude. She says here again, one might also think of these events as just part of another cycle in history. That is, there are always periods of great reform and progressive hope, and then a regression to oppression and war. Hearing about this new emphasis on Mashiach, some people fear that you're setting yourself up for disappointment, and that it's very dangerous to read into these events some impending arrival of the Mashiach, because it hasn't happened for the last several thousand years. And Rabbi Friedman says, that's exactly true. And that's why it has to happen now. This fear of disappointment, I think, is a very invalid and insubstantial argument. There's always a chance that we might fail in the things we hope for, the things we work hard for. But that is not an argument against doing it. 
She says, nevertheless, in the past in Jewish history, when Messianic movements have arisen, such as Bar Chokba or Shabbat Tezvi, the resulting disappointment was a disaster for the Jewish people. The disappointment is not a simple thing. It's not like being disappointed in love. Rabbi Friedman says, the stronger the virtue, the greater is the damage if it doesn't work. But we should distinguish between today and the past failures of Bar Kokhba and Shabbat Tzvi. Really, the two are very different. Bar Kokhba didn't turn out to be a disaster. He just didn't accomplish the goal. And Shabbat Tzvi turned out to be a disaster. But what they all have in common, all the past messianic fervor, is that they happened in a time of great trouble when people were really desperate, when they had reached the bottom of the cycle, and the only way to go was up, and ha- it had to be Mashiach, which is understandable. When things are that dark, you have to hope for something. You have to look forward to something. On the other hand, it is still a virtue, and a compliment to the Jewish people that our faith is so strong that for 3,000 years we have been consistently confident of his arrival And what's unique about this time around is that we're doing very well. There is no great trouble. Things are relatively good for Jews today. And she says, Many people agree that the concept of Mashiach is important in Judaism, but point to passages in the Talmud which say that we mustn't speculate about these things, that we can anticipate Mashiach, but we're not supposed to inquire into whom it is or talk about signs of the times. Friedman says, on the other hand, the Talmud in the Sanhedrin says that the sages were very unhappy with people who set dates and made predictions about the time of Mashiach's arrival. But on the other hand, Anyone who doesn't expect Mashiach here every day is a heretic. So how do we reconcile this? And she says, well, how do we? Friedman says, if the average person were to start making predictions and say, I think according to the signs, to the stars, to this, to that, to the other, that Mashiach is coming tomorrow. That's wrong, he says. Mashiach is coming today, always today, never tomorrow, never next week or next month, because we're not supposed to rely on signs. We're supposed to believe and trust that God said he's going to send Mashiach, and God will send him today. That's the only resolution to this kind of conflict. So on the one hand, yes, it's true that we shouldn't play around with predictions. But on the other hand, if somebody says, I know Mashiach and he's alive today, That's great. She says, you just said a minute ago that it's wrong for every Tom, Dick, and Harry to start making these predictions. Rabbi Friedman said, we're not talking about predictions. The predictions are not kosher. But if somebody says, Mashiach is here, I know someone, and he is Mashiach, that's fine. She says, in the passage you quoted earlier, Mahmanides says you can assume someone is Mashiach, but you don't know it is for sure unless certain conditions are met. Friedman says, right, assume it, hope it, like Rabbi Akiva did. He went and carried Bar Kokhba's armor for him. She says, but as for Shabbat V, we have seen that when people do get very worked up about Mashiach and they're wrong, the consequences are bad. Rabbi Friedman, but how can you reconcile this fear of a false Mashiach with your belief in Mashiach? What does your belief in Mashiach consist of if you're afraid that he might be a false Mashiach? When the real Mashiach does come, what are we going to say? Who's going to believe him? Are we going to say, got to be careful, remember the Shabbat V? She says, still people find finger pointing very unsettling. They feel that it's very dangerous to point to someone and claim that he's the Mashiach. Rabbi Friedman, if people can point a finger to someone and say, this is Mashiach, that simply shows how alive and vibrant their faith in Mashiach is. Whether this person is or is not Mashiach is irrelevant. 
And she says, would you say that it's irrelevant even, for example, if we decide on the wrong person? New religions have been formed as a result of the belief that certain persons were the Mashiach, and Judaism suffered considerably when these other religions persecuted the Jews for refusing to accept these messiahs. Rabbi Friedman says the same is true of belief in God. The belief in God has been the cause of a lot of suffering, too. If you believe in the wrong God, or you start fighting over who God is, it also causes trouble. But you can't use the abuse of something as an argument against it. And the same thing holds true for attributing great powers to an individual. Just because there was a Jim Jones and a Jim Swaggart, are you going to say that you shouldn't believe in anybody? It's because we don't believe in the right people that these charlatans find their way into these positions. If we're open to the idea that somebody alive today is Mashiach, whether it's some Kabbalist in Israel or a Rosh Shiva in Lakewood, New Jersey, that would indicate that our belief in Mashiach is alive and healthy and well. Then when Mashiach comes, there will be no problem. She says, what we would imply by these claims is that this is a person who is a great leader and a teacher. Not a miracle worker, but somebody who could bring the potential for goodness into the world if we paid more attention. Rabbi Friedman says, yes. She says in the Talmud, Sanhedrin 98b, the sages have an interesting discussion about the name of Mashiach. Each school claims that he is their teacher. The school of Rav Shila said his name is Shiloh. The school of Rabbi Yanai said his name is Yanon. And the school of Rabbi Hanina said his name is Hanina. This passage seems to support your interpretation. Rabbi Friedman says, yes, the commentaries say that each one thought that his Rebbe was Mashiach. She says, then why is it, do you think, that such interpretations of Mashiach make many people so uncomfortable? Why are people so afraid to identify a potential Mashiach? Rabbi says, for a long time, since the Enlightenment movement, Jews have been a little bit reticent on the subject of Mashiach because it was one area in which the enlightened Jew ridiculed the observant Jews' totally blind faith. Mashiach is really probably the only subject or the only issue in Jewish life that is completely blind faith. Anything else can be explained by historical or theological reasoning, but Mashiach's coming is totally beyond reason. God said he's going to come, so he's going to come. And there was a time when rational, logical arguments reigned supreme. We were a little bit ashamed of the fact that we held this totally irrational belief, and so we soft-pedaled it and we stopped talking about Mashiach in public because it would only open us up to ridicule. I think that still lingers. We're ashamed because we don't know how to justify it, don't know how to explain it, can't rationalize it. It is our faith, and we're not comfortable with faith. We're comfortable with logic. She says, maybe we should talk a little bit about the nature of the Messianic era itself. I know that the Talmud makes distinctions between the pre-Messianic era and the Messianic era itself. Rabbi Friedman says there will be a time called the Days of Mashiach, Yemot HaMashiach, which is different from the world to come, the Olam Abba. In Yemot HaMashiach, nature does not change. You don't have any resurrection of the dead. You don't have disruption of nature. All you have is total universal goodness and morality. And that would mean that nation does not oppress nation, that there is no suppression of religion, and so on. And we're beginning to see that today. Take the fact that you really can't find any place in the globe where a Jewish community is not permitted to practice Judaism. She says, what about Iran, for example? Rabbi Friedman says, Jews are allowed to practice Judaism in Iran. If you practice Zionism, then you're killed. But if you go to Davin with your tefillin, 
No, nothing at all. In Saudi Arabia, it's forbidden, but there are no Jews there. And this overall global freedom for Jewish practice has no precedence in the last 2,000 years. So in that sense, there's a gula, redemption for the Yiddishkeit in the world. To return to our point, in the days of Mashiach, morality becomes the norm, or maybe the primary pursuit of mankind. The world to come, however, is when nature itself starts to change, when earth becomes heaven, and then it's eternal, and there's no death. She says, you are saying that there exists this messianic potential, and you see it in the signs today, but it could very well be that the potential might not be realized in our generation, even though we might be very close, right? Rabbi Friedman says, when you say that you believe that Mashiach is coming, then you cannot entertain the possibility that he's not coming. Why not? She asks. The belief in Mashiach is not the belief in a possibility. The belief in the coming of Mashiach is the belief in the fact that he is coming. Yes, she says, but doesn't the fact that he's coming mean that at any given time it is only a possibility? There's a belief that ultimately he will come, but it's not necessarily today. The belief is in the potential for him to come every day. Rabbi Friedman says, now there's the difference between the way the Rebbe looks at Emunah, faith, and the Mashiach and the conventional approach. The conventional approach is that the belief in Mashiach means that you have to believe that Mashiach could come. That's not correct. Why, she asks. That's not faith at all. To say that there's a possibility, there are all sorts of possibilities. That's not complete faith. Emuna Shlema. Emuna Shlema means you cannot conceive of a world today without Mashiach. Not that he could come, but that he must come. And Mashiach's coming is dependent on our God's will. We did his will. I did my best today. What else does he want? She says, maybe you did your best in fulfilling the mitzvot today, but not everybody did. Does the promise that Mashiach will come today if you do my will mean that everyone must do God's will? Rabbi Friedman says, that's a genuine point of contention. Are we good enough? Have we done enough? Are we ready for Mashiach? The Rebbe says we are. She says, why does he think so? Rebbe Friedman says, because the Rebbe looks at us as a historical collective, not just as one generation. And the Jewish people, having gone through 2,000 years of this horrible exile, are more than ready and more than deserving. She says, why? Because we've suffered? Rabbi says, yes, not only suffered, but we have suffered well. We have excelled in suffering without losing our faith. She says, so your point is that there is a crucial difference between a certain view of the Mashiach as a possibility and an emuna shlema, which is the conviction that he is coming. Rabbi says, yes, emuna shlema is the conviction that Mashiach is coming now. She says, that's what we're tangling about. Even if I am obligated to expect that Mashiach could come now, I don't know that's for sure. So I must be open to the possibility that he may not come now. I do not have the chutzpah to interpret every single sign. I think this is the core of our discussion. Rabbi Friedman says, even if you don't interpret the signs, you are commanded to believe that Mashiach is coming today. Not that he might come. We say that every day in the prayers. Not that he could come, but as the text says, I believe with total faith in the coming of Mashiach. That's the first part of the statement. What does it mean to believe with perfect faith? That even though he hasn't come in 2,000 years, yet every day I expect him to come. This is the definition of emunah, of faith in anything, not just in Mashiach. Emunah means that this is something that has to be. Now, there are those things that can possibly exist, and then there is absolute necessary existence. 
If you believe that Mashiach is coming, then you cannot entertain the possibility that he may not come. And she asks, how is that specifically the definition of emunah? Rabbi Friedman has a lot of patience and it says, emunah is supra-rational. It is an irrational conviction that something just has to be. And it's not just Mashiach. We all have this quality in some way. To take an example, many of us are convinced that people are basically good. Now that doesn't come from experience. We might ask, what is the definition of an ideal? An ideal means a conviction about how things must be, not how they are. And therefore, you can't come to an idealist and say, what do you mean you believe people are good? Look at so-and-so and and who is a mass murderer. That will have no effect on his or her idealism because their idealism states that this is how it must be. And if it isn't yet, then it will be because it must. Are you perhaps saying that we get that idealism from a higher source? That these notions of Mashiach and goodness come to us from a kind of revelation? Rabbi says, yes. She asks, but how can we be sure that this particular irrationality is trustworthy and not a hallucination? Friedman says, how do we trust any of our ideals? Why do we spend billions in search of a cure for cancer? Because you're convinced. It just can't be that there is no cure. Now, what convinces you of that? She says, well, I could argue that my faith in modern medicine has been backed up by evidence. It's not irrational to think that knowledge advances because I have, in fact, seen cures for many things that were not previously curable. Rabbi Friedman, right. But when they started the research on cancer, we were just as certain of it then. So it's not the evidence that's convincing us that there is a cure. It's a belief that we just simply cannot accept a world in which there are incurable diseases and evil. Handelman says, and I'm asking myself, how much longer is this back and forth going to go? Maybe you are too, Marty, wondering, huh? How long are they going to get to the point? Okay, well, it's an important subject and I'm going over my 30 minutes, people. So hang in there if you want to get to the end of this. I'm going to read it to the end. <laughs> Marty says, indeed. Yep. Okay. I know it's enough talk, but I feel like this subject is important. So I need to continue on. This optimism, Rabbi says, the need to believe that there is a light at the end of the tunnel can be very adaptive. It can help us go on in times of great trouble. On the other hand, optimism can be destructive. It can blind us to reality. It can also, as some critics of Lubavitch have said, leads to passivity in relation to the needs of the moment. Okay, let me have a sip of coffee, wet my whistle here while you're still listening. Marty's being faithful today, listening, listening. Until now, Lubavitch has been accused of being too aggressive. We're coming on too strong. We're pushing too much. We're going too far. All of a sudden, we're passive. But of course, if you start noticing a passivity resulting from the belief in the Mashiach, that's not a belief. It's a cop-out. If you believe in Mashiach, you become more active. You don't become less active. I agree. But she says, some critics have argued that an intensified messianism is dangerous because it can lead people to take very extreme and unrealistic political positions. What are the connections of messianism as you have described it? to political action in Israel. Rabbi says, I think you should take Mashiach the way it's meant to be, that you merely intensify all the things that God wants of you and all the things that the Torah wants from you. If Mashiach is Mashiach, then mitzvot become more natural and goodness becomes more natural. You don't start projects that are new, that are different. Whatever we're supposed to do in Israel, we were supposed to do with or without Mashiach. 
And what are we supposed to do in Israel? Oy vavoy. I'm saying that, not the rabbi, but anyway, rabbi says, make sure that the Jews in Israel are safe. That's priority number one. So as the rabbi says, fortify the borders. Make no concessions because it would be dangerous to do so. That's a law in Shulchan Aruch from in the Ora Chaim chapter 329. It's not messianic. And this is another good point. So for you academics that are listening, making sure that Israel's borders are safe is a written law in Shulchan Aruch, Orach Chaim, chapter 329. She says, suppose I'm not a Lubavitcher and I still want to become more active. What should I do? Rabbi says, Ta- talk up Yiddishkeit. There you go. Talk up Yiddishkeit. Assume that your Jewish neighbor or business associate wants to be more observant. All you have to do is show him how and give him the opportunity and expose him to mitzvah. And that will take care of it. Yes. So there you have it, people. Talk up Yiddishkeit. That sounds like a t-shirt to me. And why will that bring Mashiach, she says. Because... Mashiach could have come at any moment, right? If he decides to come, he comes. But if he's waiting all these years, it must mean that he doesn't want to overwhelm us. The coming of Mashiach cannot be one of those glassy-eyed, overwhelming experiences like the exodus from Egypt or the giving of the Torah at Sinai because those things just don't last. Because again, it's God doing it, not us. It's the initiator, not the response. So Mashiach cannot come unilaterally because then it's not Mashiach. It's just another good event in our long history of miracles and revelations. In order for Mashiach to come without disrupting us, without blowing us away, we have to have some awareness or some readiness or some ability to handle the idea that the world is becoming good and that evil and suffering are going to end. Like the bumper sticker that says, visualize world peace. If you can't make it happen, visualize it, at least be able to conceive of it. So if we get more and more people thinking, yes, it is time for the world to become good. Maybe we could actually realize that which everyone has always insisted and believed that the world will someday be good. But why someday? Why not today? If we can just get that thinking, then we're ready for Mashiach. We don't have to do it. We just have to be open to it. She says, I'm interested in what you just said, that the arrival of Mashiach is not a glassy-eyed ecstatic event. I think most people do have that idea in mind, perhaps because of the influence of the non-Jewish notions of Mashiach. I agree, says the rabbi. That's the idea that Mashiach comes in a flash. One moment he's not here, the next moment he's here, and everything is perfect. But that can't happen because that means that godliness has not come down to earth. Is that then the ultimate meaning of Mashiach, that godliness has come down to earth? Rabbi says that godliness becomes obvious. It's no longer a miraculous spiritual thing. It's obvious. She says, all in all, you're interpreting the whole idea of Mashiach's coming as a kind of gradual recognition of God. And at the same time, you're saying that there will be a new form of revelation. There is the gradualness, which you just described, and then there is something really new and different. Rabbi says, it's going to be radical change, but not disruptive. A grassroots kind of thing, not revelation from heaven, but revelation from within, so to speak. It'll dawn on us. It won't shock us. She says, and what precisely will dawn? He says that God is real and that goodness is real and that evil is false and that darkness is only imaginary. But evil is real, isn't it? People do suffer. People are hungry. People are homeless. People are ill. Yes, he says, but the idea that gamzu letova, this too is for the best, which today is something we have to bite our tongues on when we say, this will become obvious when Mashiach comes. We will see the goodness in what previously appeared to be evil. 
She says, someone recently wrote that he's no longer waiting for the Mashiach. His point was, where was the Mashiach when we needed him, such as during the Holocaust? He's too late. Rabbi says, that's a good question. I'm waiting to ask Mashiach myself. When Mashiach comes, we will find out why, wherefore. She says, how will we find that out? It's not Mashiach who is going to give all the answers because Mashiach is just a human being, right? He said, he may have the answer or the answer may just become apparent of itself. When the darkness lifts, we begin to see clearly. But it's a good question. Like the Talmud says, Teku, that Elijah the prophet will answer all the unresolved questions and problems in the times of Mashiach. So this is one of those questions we cannot answer until Mashiach comes. She says, well, as I understand what you have said, the objective is to bring Mashiach, and to do that we need to increase in the observance of Torah and mitzvot, and to get others to, to do the same. But could we accomplish this more effectively without talking about Mashiach, since the topic creates so much controversy? The Rebbe says, there are those who believe that you should get people to do mitzvot without telling them about God because God is a difficult subject for people. No, you can't do that. If your enthusiasm is coming from the fact that you believe Mashiach is imminent, then you should share that with others. Why hide it? What are we apologizing for here? She says so. Being ready means helping other Jews and talking about Mashiach. Rabbi Friedman says, being ready means that if he shows up today, you will not be shocked. You won't be speechless. Ready means that we won't be overwhelmed. Mashiach does not want to overwhelm us because if he were going to overwhelm us, he could have come a hundred years ago. I think that it's important for us to understand that much of the fear and discomfort with the excitement about Mashiach comes from associations people make with something apocalyptic and with the disruption of normal life of packing up and waiting to be flown to Jerusalem. It is important to disabuse ourselves of this notion that Mashiach comes and blows everything to pieces because, in fact, this isn't the way it is. Somebody was visiting the Lubavitch World Headquarters in Brooklyn recently and was shocked to find that it is in the process of elaborate renovations. He thought that the Lubavitchers' excitement about Mashiach implied that people would pack their bags and stop all normal activity. What he found, however, was quite to the contrary. We are not drifting away and losing our grounding in reality. In fact, the day-to-day -day normal activity gains momentum because of this excitement and this desire to bring Mashiach. And there you have the story at its end. And kudos to those of you that are still in the chat listening faithfully. <laughs> what faith you have, Amuna. <laughs> and if you would like to actually read this again or reference it in one of your teachings, you can look at Wellsprings, a journal of Jewish thought. And the author of this article, which I give full credit to, is Susan Handelman. Thank you for listening. And I would like to close with my song, which just came out this week. So perhaps there's some kind of prophetic timing in the release of this song in light of reading this article. It's called Waiting, and it's about the question how long till the Messiah comes. So now when you listen to the lyrics of this song that I'm about to share, perhaps you can do some thinking, some meditating in the listening and ask yourself these questions in light of what you had just heard. And I thank you for listening. This is Deborah Cohen. I encourage you to share the music and you can use the song Waiting as a Yiddish kite tool. Waiting. The world is waiting for you. When will the great day be? When your feet step on holy ground for all the world to see. Some say they know your name, but many disagree. 
On that great day in Jerusalem, every knee will bow and all the eyes will see. Thank mm-hmm. you.